Thank you. All right. So thanks for that uh, great introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming out here. Uh, I know that it's been a gloomy couple of weeks, uh, lots of rain, but uh, you know the sun is shining. Your midterms are pretty much over, hopefully all wrapped up by now. <laughs> No thanks to me, uh, but uh, and I know that you're going to leave here feeling encouraged and motivated to follow your passions, and and you're going to be carrying out some practical steps on how to follow and pursue your personal vision of excellence. So I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I want to thank the Flourish Emory team, the uh, Barclay Forum. Uh, and of course the TEDx Emory for uh, hosting me. It's, this, it's really a huge honor to speak to you today. Um, so this week has been kind of surreal for me. I've been walking around campus and seeing this like goofy mug plastered everywhere. Uh, it's like, who's this egomaniac? You know? <laughs> but, uh, but no, it really is a, a huge honor to be able to talk to you today. And, uh, and especially to be in the company of so many fantastic lectures that we've already had. Um, in my mind, these are some of the most inspirational people on campus. And it's really humbling to be, um, you know, even sharing the same stage with them. And also just a little bit terrifying because, uh, you know, they're some of the top teachers and faculty members that we have here at Emory. So, to kind of relieve some of that anxiety, what I hope to do is, although this is gonna start as a talk, I hope to kind of transition this into a conversation. I wanna take the focus off me. Uh, this is really, tonight is really about you guys. It's about what you can achieve. And uh, so we're gonna be celebrating and talking about some of the work that the Emory undergraduates, you guys are actually doing in your pursuit of this eudaimonia, the good life. So I hope you'll leave here convinced of three things. And my intro students will know this well. One, you are your neurons. That the neural networks that make up you are, ref are a reflection of those neurons. And two, that these neurons have unique characteristics that can serve in kind of a fractal-like way, these pieces that can actually explain the whole of us. And three, through this process, we can actually identify our own uh, personal motivational drives. And, um, and I hope that you'll be walking away with some practical steps that you can use even tonight to start pursuing your personal vision of excellence. So before I get into the neuroscience, as Melissa mentioned, so I, I grew up in Juneau, Alaska, surrounded by nature. I'm, this, is, this is how I got to where I am today. So um, I grew up on my family's fishing lodge, playing on bear streams. My, uh, my elementary school was less than two miles away from the spectacular Mendenhall Glacier, as seen from afar from here, and very up close underneath it, actually here. So I spent a lot of time in the outdoors surrounded by this kind of beauty. And you can imagine what that does to a child being surrounded by this all the time. It, for me, it really sparked this interest in understanding nature, understanding like how these things came about. And this is what eventually led me to pursue this degree in neuroscience and biology at Davidson College in North Carolina. And I, um, when I got there, all the way up to my junior year, I really thought I was going to go into field biology because I just love the outdoors. I love understanding those kinds of things. But junior year comes around, and like most uh, undergraduates, we're all scrambling to find coursework, right? Fill our schedules. And I was running out of options. And one of the options that I had left was this introductory neuroscience course. So this ended up being the hardest course that I had ever taken in my entire life. And I absolutely fell in love with it. So I had this awesome professor, Dr. Julio Ramirez, and, uh, and that semester I was one of eight students in the course that was lucky enough to unwittingly discover the ultimate liberal art, neuroscience. It was this 
beautiful combination of psychology, biology, physics, chemistry, and most importantly, philosophy. So neuroscience, we know today, has, has all kinds of applications. It's this rapidly growing field. We put neuro, the word neuro in front of all kinds of things, neuroeconomics, neuromarketing, neurolinguistics, on and on and on. And it's really informed our understanding of a lot of these different fields. But um, today I'm going to use it to inform our understanding of self-fulfillment and its relationship to Aristotle's idea of eudaimonia. So we're going to call it neuro-eudaimonia. Do <laughs> uh, you think? No? Uh, I think it has a nice ring to it. Maybe it's, it's, it does sound a little medical. like maybe some kind of disease or something like, you hear about Kazama? Yeah, it turns out it was eudaimonia. <laughs> it's not doing so hot. <laughs> but yeah, maybe we'll leave off the eudaimonia, neuro-eudaimonia for now. So, um, so how does this relate to, how do we combine neuroscience and eudaimonia? So I, I think that neuroscience is able to do this because uh, the root of what makes us human is our brain. That, this brain is made up of little neurons, and these are organized in, under a set of principles, and these principles really can be used to represent the whole. So it's this fractal-like feature that makes neuroscience so relevant to Aristotle's concept of eudaimonia, or the good life. So those of you who have taken my intro class may recognize this quote. I always kick off my intro neuroscience class with this quote. The reason I do it is because on my very first neuroscience class, Dr. Ramirez started me off with this quote, and it got me hooked. So what he said was that everything you are, all of your memories, your abilities, your emotion, even your spirituality, all of that happens because there's little neurons in your head that either fired or didn't fire. And somehow, all of these yeses and nos turn into the person that you are. And that really blew my mind. Another thing that he said was that the human brain is the only thing we know about in the universe that's actually studying itself, trying to figure itself out. And I've thought about this concept a lot. And again, we have this kind of fractal idea that pops up where it's not just the human being that's contemplating its existence and purpose, it's the brain that's also doing that. And that brain is made up of billions of neurons that are, you know, also going on. This can go on and on. So I, I recently came across this quote from uh, the physicist Michio Kaku, and he said that physicists are made of atoms, and a physicist is an attempt by an atom to understand itself. To which I would say, well played physics. Um, <laughs> So, you know, we could follow this all the way down to the, you know, the smallest known entity, but I'm going to stop at the level of the neuron for this talk. Um, trust me, you don't want to hear me try and explain string theory. Um, so, the point is that by understanding the nature of the single neuron, that we can understand the nature of ourselves. So, this is a depiction of a neuron firing connecting to another neuron. Your brain is made of roughly a hundred billion of these, and each of which has some really interesting properties, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. These are properties that I think can be used as fractals to inform the whole of our lives. So why would this be the case? Well, these billions of neurons come together to form neural networks, and each of these neural networks are what makes up you. So each neural network is, an in, is uniquely individual, but it's also made up of neurons that have their own individual purposes. Each neuron also is shaped by its experience, just like you are. And each neuron also contains all the DNA that's been handed down to you through your ancestors. Your, the memories of your ancestors literally live on in every single cell of your body. So this is what I mean by fractal-like. One piece repeated billions of times 
to make up the entirety of your consciousness. So I'm going to briefly run through three properties of individual neurons that challenge us to think about how we're built. So the first characteristic that I want to highlight is dynamic balance. So this is the basis for everything and the piece, the smallest piece of our fractal that we're talking about today. So when we think about balance, we often think about a static structure. So how often have you been hiking up this mountain and uh, you come across these, these stacks of rocks, one carefully balanced on the next? And this is how we often think about balance. Um, it's a goal to be achieved. You never see these stacks down at the bottom of the trailhead, right? No, no, no. You put that up on the top of the mountain. This is a, this is a monument. But we often tell ourselves that, that balance is something to be achieved, some kind of goal. Well, once I graduate or get that job, then, then I'll have life balance. Once I get, get through this little stressed point, this exam, then I'll have balance. I just need to get through this, then my life will be complete. And this is a monument of static balance. And what I want to tell you today is that this is not how your neurons are actually built. Neurons have this finely tuned balance, but it doesn't look like this at all. Neurons keep a dynamic balance. They're constantly firing and resetting. Think about how much closer this is to your daily reality. You're grinding, firing those neurons with a couple study breaks thrown in between. Right? The fact is that while you're firing and resetting, your neurons are also doing the same thing, but they're doing this at a, a feverish pace. So how active are these neurons? How often do they fire and reset? It's hard to put an exact number on it because there's so much individual variation, but I've read anywhere from 200 to 300 times per second. That's the average. Pop, 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 pop. That's what they're doing, right? So what, is that, what does that look like? So as you probably know, your brains run on electricity. And actually, only about 12 watts. So think about that. That means that we have the fastest com supercomputers on the planet in our head running on the same amount of power it takes to light a compact fluorescent light bulb. 12 watts. Keep in mind, our fastest supercomputer, the Titan supercomputer, takes 8.2 million watts to run. So we're doing pretty well with our 12 watts, right? So this amazing graph here depicts the electrical activity of a single neuron. And this is only five thousandths of a second, a very brief period. And here's right before the neuron fires. Here it is firing and it's resetting and it's ready to go again. So this whole event is called the action potential. So think about those words as it correlates, as it, as it relates to static balance. Action and potential. It's simply a product of biology, chemistry, and physics. But I'm going to pull a little philosophy out of it too after I explain it. So, so what this is showing is the balance of the cell. So if we take an electrode here and we put it down and attach it to the cell, we can record um, the electrical voltage of that cell. So um, that's what this graph is showing. This zero point is the point at which this, the, inside of the, outs, the inside of the neuron is matched by the outside of the neuron. This is in, the neuron would be in perfect balance. And you can see as we go down, the neuron gets uh, charged more and more and more as it's ready to fire. So it's like this rubber band being pulled taut, ready to fire. So the firing process is a really technical process. And luckily, my intro student, Tammy, uh, found a way to break it down. So, uh, and I promise this is as technical as I'm going to get in this talk. So <laughs> here you can see Drake uh, shuttling these electrically charged ions represented by these balls back and forth across the membrane. So this is the inside of the cell over here. This is the outside of the cell. 
And as the cell fires, uh, these uh, sodium ions rush in, and then the, uh, as he's kind of hot blinging his way across the membrane, shuttling things back and forth, right? So, if only all of our scientific principles could be expressed through interpretive dance, right? <laughs> So you could see that this neuron is holding a dynamic balance, waiting for the signal to fire. And I want you to note a couple things about this graph. This is what I think is really cool about it. The first thing is that this area down here is called the resting state. And, but it's not actually at rest. It's, it's actually a really dynamic process. I mean, you got Drake and a whole host of other proteins, you know, shaking their tails down here, trying to keep this neuron ready to fire. The second thing I want you to notice is this zero point, that there's only two very brief moments in time where this neuron is actually perfectly in balance. Think about this as we think about our life. This is your fall break, and this is your Thanksgiving, <laughs> right? The rest of the time, you're grinding. So notice that this is different than how we typically think about balance, right? Especially life balance. Balance isn't a goal, it's a fluid process. Maybe this idea of dynamic balance could have worked its way into our culture, maybe our religion. Maybe it did it at multiple time points. So I think this is where we get into the idea of the Tao or the way. So I absolutely love this figure because, I mean, we've seen it everywhere. It's on t-shirts, bumper stickers, martial arts dojos all around the country. Um, but let's take a deeper look at it. This was created as a representation of the balance of life. The yin and the yang, the dark and the light, the feminine, the masculine, and all of the dual opposing forces found in nature. We know this symbol dates all the way back earlier than at least 1000 BC, some think much farther, and we actually see it pop up across different cultures. This is a Roman shield design, this is a Celtic design, and this is uh, you know, the, obviously the flag of uh, South Korea. And we, so we see, we see this symbol across many different cultures, um, India, Asia, the rest of Asia. Um, but what's so special about this symbol? I think that this isn't meant to be a static symbol. This, this is a, a symbol that's in movement. It's holding dynamic balance. The whole is in balance, but actually, if you look at this symbol, there's only one tiny area of this symbol that's in perfect balance. It's this seam right here. This, the transition point between the yin and the yang. Just like this graph, a very small part is actually spent in balance. So there's one other really cool thing as I was researching this. Um, and that's the Chinese characters that make up the symbol for the Tao or the Wei. So it's, it has two radicals. This one here is the radical for going or movement. Think of like a hand pointing the direction. And this is my favorite part. This is the radical for head. And it's literally an organ with hair on top. So there's a brain right in the, in the character for Wei. It's, you're literally heading in a direction, right? <laughs> Uh, so the neurons that make you, you operate on this symbol, just like this. It's just like your life. So let's, um, they only experience very brief moments of true balance. So let's pull this back to a, a, a macro for a second. I think that we need to stop trying to tie the idea of life satisfaction to these very brief moments of balance, the static, the static balance. We need to figure out how to find satisfaction in the moments of imbalance, which as we know, are most of the time, right? So some of my most memorable and satisfying moments have actually come while I was in a moment of way out of balance. So I'll take my intro neuroscience course as an example. So, this course, I had to actually interview to get into the course so that Dr. Ramirez could tell me how hard it was gonna be. Um, this class met twice as long as any of the, the other courses for the same amount of credit. 
that had a lab seven days a week. My first, my first uh, closed book exam took me nine hours to complete. And I wasn't even the slowest test taker. I mean, There's a ridiculous amount of work. However, that class changed my life. That, it, it gave me a new direction to head in, and the things that I learned in that class stuck with me even to today. So, you're here at Emory because you want to change and grow. Your resting state, your baseline, is about dynamic growth. So, once you embrace this principle, you'll be able to appreciate those fleeting moments of static balance, those fall breaks, you know, the Thanksgiving coming up. So make sure you get those moments, but recognize that the majority of your time spent here at Emory is gonna be about change and growth. And that's a wonderful thing. That's how you're gonna reach your enormous potential. So these neurons are built for dynamic balance, and the next fractal-like characteristic that I wanna talk about is this idea that neurons are constantly adapting, exploring, and growing. So Aristotle believed that the person must go through a process of growth through education and experience, and that this is what is gonna lead to the good life. And I think he'd be pretty pleased to know that neurons do the exact same thing. Your neurons are constantly in a state of growth and change. They're constantly sending out tendrils from the minute you're born to the day you die, trying to improve the system to find meaning. And as you grow, these neurons end up traveling huge distances. So if we take this cell body as um, kind of a reference point for size, this axon that's going to be sent out is going to go all the way from Emory to a specific location in LA. So they're traveling huge relative distances. And, you know, three to five feet may not seem like a lot to us, but for a neuron, this is, this is a huge distance, a huge amount of growth. So these neurons are not afraid of long distance relationships. So part of, part of these growths are just explorations. Uh, they're connecting up, they're seeing uh, what's out there, and you're born with twice as many neurons as you're going to end up with by the time you reach adulthood. They're going to start getting paired away. And the cells that stick around do that by exploring, and their futures are determined by the nature of their connections. Through their genetic expression, their location in the brain, and they turn into individual and unique neurons. This is the fractal-like nature I want to emphasize. As neurons develop, they turn into unique cells, each with their own purpose. So these are some reconstructions of some various neurons that you can actually find in your own brain. There's millions of these examples. And what I want you to note about these is how different they are. They all have their unique shapes and keep in mind that these shapes are directly related to their function. So um, remember how important a neuron's connection is to its purpose. It's defined by its connections. A neuron all by itself, it's not even a little bit useful. It's gotta have those connections. On average, we have roughly 100 trillion connections in our brain. This is as many connections as there are stars in our Milky Way galaxy. So think about that the next time you look up. Well, actually in Atlanta, you're gonna see like two stars because we have a lot of light pollution. But go, <laughs> go to some place remote, like Utah or something, look up, and what you're gonna see is this beautiful, expansive Milky Way, and this represents the same number of connections that you have in your head. So connection is key. Pulling this back to the macro again for a moment. Loneliness leads to a whole host of problems. It's, it hurts our immune system, our cognitive abilities, our attention. Uh, loneliness is devastating. And we're social animals, and we operate best when we form these deep connections with other people. So be, I would encourage you to be courageous. Put yourself out there and your neurons do it, and so can you. So 
The neurons that make you you are operating under the principles of dynamic balance. They're changing, growing, exploring their universe. They're connecting up with other neurons. And the last fractal-like property I'm going to talk about is that neurons are purpose-driven. Your neurons develop. They form these unique connections based on their location in your brain, your genetics, your unique experiences. And as neurons mature, they kind of land on a purpose. This isn't unlike picking a major. So the neurons in your auditory cortex, some of them are going to major in English, French, Spanish. You have other neurons in your motor cortex that are going to be majoring in kinesiology. Maybe you have some of these higher level neurons in the front part, they're going to be majoring in religion and philosophy. So um, together, they're going to form neural networks that are going to achieve a goal. So let's transition up to the level of our experiences, our motivations, our purpose. I've described a couple of uh, this concept of dynamic balance. I've described the concept of the way. And uh, this implies that we need to take this balance and give it a direction, a purpose. So how do we figure out where to head? Remember that you're a product of your, the specific layout of your neurons and those are influenced by a combination of your ancestors, your genetics, your culture, and of course your environment, even here at Emory. So this, is, this should be your starting point. This gives each of us unique motivational drives. So I was born, I was, grew up in Alaska surrounded by Hawaiians on the fishing lodge, being raised by my Japanese grandparents. Um, so it, it was truly a polycultural experience, as Dean Nair would have said. So that's a pretty unique experience, and it gave me some very unique motivational drives. But the point is that each of you have your own unique experiences, and you have your own unique motivational drives. So this is where we get into the idea of eudaimonia. So this is my all-time favorite quote. It's something I hope will resonate with you. So this is often attributed to uh, Zen philosophy, and it is very Zen, but it was actually written by the educator Lawrence Pearsall Jacks. So what he said was that the master in the art of living makes little distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his education and his recreation, his love and his religion. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence at whatever he does, leaving other, others to decide whether he's working or playing. He is always doing both. To me, this is how we achieve self-fulfillment in life. We figure out what drives us. We find activities that satisfy those drives. So I would bet that all of us at some point have found an activity that we've been involved in to be deeply satisfying. Something maybe that an outside person would have looked in and said, it looks like work. But for you, it felt like play. Imagine if you were able to center your life around those passions. Imagine if you found your vision of excellence. And what I want to tell you today is that you can do that. In fact, it's not only possible, there are people in this room who are doing it. That this is, they're already on this path towards self-fulfillment. So here's where I want to now turn this into a conversation. So I want to hear what kinds of things you're doing, what kinds of things you're passionate about, and what kinds of activities you're engaged in that are neither work nor play. So I'm going to start off this conversation by talking a little bit about some things that my wife and I are doing with our kids to help them understand how to find their vision of excellence. So James and Grace, they absolutely love sports. And from a very early age, they're always very active. James with his soccer and tennis, Grace with her rock climbing. Um, and uh, so my wife have, and I have been nurturing this love of athletics. And, uh, but we also wanted them to start interacting with the world, thinking about other people, making the world a better place. 
And we had a lot of potential options, right? We could have sent them to you know, volunteer in a soup kitchen. No good, they're super picky. No offense. Uh, you know, we could have taken them to a pet adoption agency. You know, they could have volunteered for that. Also no good, we would have had 10 cats, right? What we did was we uh, took them to the Special Olympics and had them volunteer for that. And guess what? We had a blast. They were passionate about this anyways. So Grace was helping to escort the athletes to and from the events. James was running times, you know, all over the Emory track. And we just had the best time. It's, it was a series of truly inspirational moments. That This was filled with the purest form of competition. We had athletes trying their very hardest, competing as hard as they can, yet so full of compassion that they'd rather help their friend across the finish line than finish first. I mean, like what a lesson, right? So during these activities, you know, we weren't working or playing, we were doing both. And right now their passion is in, in sports and we'll continue to find these kinds of activities as long as they keep loving it. Sports often kind of naturally transition into this worker play idea. When we talk about sports, we play sports, but we work out. We love the competition, but those practices are grueling and they're taxing mentally and physically. So I have at least two Emory undergrads who are athletes here at, at Emory, and they've taught me a lot about surrounding yourself with activities that fulfill your passion. The first is Liz. So Liz is the captain of the soccer team, and uh, she loves soccer, but she's also helping others volunteer through coaching. She's uh, volunteering and working in a muscle rehabilitation lab. It doesn't stop there. She's applying for graduate school to be a physical therapist. So notice that Liz is not just checking these boxes for a resume. She's, she's uh, organizing her life around her passions. In each of these activities, she's neither working nor playing. She's doing both. I have another athlete, uh, Julie. So Julie is a 2015 uh, Sonny Carter Scholar. So she's the captain of the cross country team. She volunteers for the Autism Speaks 5K run, uh, helping autistic individuals. She also volunteered in a lab uh, researching treadmill therapy on neuronal regeneration. So she was in my learning and memory class and uh, I have this semester long project where you kind of track you teach yourself a random skill and then you track your progress over time. And what Julie chose to do was to memorize over 50 different streets and all of their intersections all around the Emory area. And she did this, most of them, by running them. So again, Julie's surrounding herself with activities that she's passionate about and you can too. I have another student, Stephen, and uh, during his time here at Emory, he's graduated now, but uh, during his time at Emory, he got really into mindfulness meditation. And uh, he volunteered in a compassion meditation training lab. And after he graduated, he went on to work in women's prisons doing compassion training there. He's about to move back to Emory and we've got him connected up with uh, the PTSD group with, uh, at the VA center. So he'll be continuing that work there. So I have tons of examples of students surrounding themselves with activities that fulfill their passions. And one of the things I love about this Flourish Emory group is that there's so many students in this group that are also doing that. That they've dialed in their own personal vision of excellence and they're leaving others to decide whether they're working or playing. They're doing both. So, Let's just relate this back to the neuron and we're just gonna finish up with, I wanna give you at least three practical tips on, um, uh, based on the properties that we discussed. So, the first one is look for activities that you know are gonna cause change and growth. So, there's all kinds of amazing activities on campus that you can be a part of opportunities to volunteer, and recognize that you've been given a really rare opportunity 
that you're surrounded with so many options here. So don't waste that. Um, use it for change and growth. Use it to make the world a better place because you're in it. So second, have the courage to explore. So try new things. Maybe you're not exactly sure what you love yet. Most of us in this room haven't dialed in on our vision of excellence. We're not quite sure what that is yet. The only way you're gonna find it is by having the courage to explore new things. So the sooner you find it, the sooner you can start constructing activities that are gonna fulfill that passion, your vision of excellence. Third, make personal connections. Just like a neuron is only use, isn't useful at all by itself, our lives will be more meaningful if we can find others to share their, our experiences with, our passions with. So as you leave here tonight, I hope that you'll pursue your vision of excellence, even if you haven't found it yet, that you'll find it. I know these concepts have brought a lot of self-fulfillment to my life, to the students who I've talked to who are living this eudaimonia, the good life. Uh, it's, there, you can find a lot of examples of professors who are doing this. Some of my mentors, Jocelyn Bachevalier, this is a lady who is, has a single-minded focus on answering some of the biggest scientific questions that we have. And she pursues this with everything that she has. She's been a great role model for me. So, as I said in the beginning, I really appreciate being able to come here and talk to you guys. Uh, I hope you're leaving here feeling encouraged, motivated to find your passions, and that you'll become masters in the art of living, just like was described by Pearsall. So thank you for your participation. I love the energy tonight. And uh, thank you for inspiring me to pursue my dreams. So I hope you have a great weekend. And thank you very much.